So what I want to talk to you about is um, how we went on to rapidly select, characterize, and now developing the clinic, fully human antibodies against emerging, emerging infectious diseases, and specifically uh, SARS-CoV-2. And let me start by saying that uh, over the last three decades or so, Regeneron, the company I'm working for, has spent um, a lot of capital, a lot of time, and a lot of effort to develop a suite of proprietary technologies to accelerate drug discovery and every single stage of drug discovery, and you can see here on the left, going from target identification to validation and making antibodies, since most of our drugs are antibodies, um, put these antibodies in cell lines, uh, produce them in high, <clears throat> in high quantities, and eventually test them in uh, the clinic and commercialize them. And using all these technologies, what we, what we call the losses suite of technologies, we now have seven FDA-approved medicines, and we have three dozen or so antibodies in various stages in clinical development, including several infectious diseases um, antibodies. And I'm going to show you some of the details about the infectious diseases antibodies in the next few slides. So this is a very repeatable and a reproducible process. We can do this over and over again using the same or similar technologies, variations of the similar technologies. And by doing that, we were able to change timelines for drug development from years to months. And we believe that because we are able to shorten timelines that much, we are able to use all these technologies for infectious diseases, especially in outbreak settings. And we've done it successfully for MERS coronavirus, Ebola virus, and now with SARS-CoV-2. The specific technologies that I'm going to talk about um, during my presentation here and are more relevant for you know, the early stages of drug discovery, research in drug discovery, are some of these uh, following technologies. One is um, the Velocity Gene and the Velocity Immune Technology, which is um, up to today one of the fastest uh, mouse genome engineering technologies. You can robotically change uh, mega, mega base pieces of the genome of the mouse, and you can use Use that to genetically humanize or do any alteration of the genome that uh, you want. Again, that's being done using a highly automated uh, robotic platform, so it can be done extremely quickly. Using the Velocity Gene technology, we made what we call the Velocity Immune Mice. And I'm going to show you some, a little bit more detail about these mice um, in the next few slides. But basically, what we did is we replaced six megabases of the mouse genome with, with um, a similar size part of the human genome. And by doing that, we replaced the variable regions for both the heavy chain and the light chain of the antibodies with the corresponding human sequences. And by doing that, these, um, uh, these uh, mice now are expressing um, uh, human antibodies. And I'm gonna show you why this is important. And then we created several technologies that we call velocity map technologies to isolate these antibodies out of the mice, put them in uh, chow cell lines to and, uh, and, and using this technology, we can uh, produce more than five grams per liter of antibody in a tall cell line. We can do that very, very quickly. So when I moved here to Regeneron about 10 years ago now, we decided to basically uh, bundle all these technologies to what we call a Regeneron rapid response, okay? So which is basically utilize all of these velocity suite platform to rapidly generate, evaluate, and develop fully human antibodies against emerging viruses. And we believe that fully human antibodies are, um, uh, very good as a rapid response capability. First of all, antibodies are extremely specific and they rarely have off-target toxicity. Our own bodies make antibodies and the antibodies that we make, uh, the immune system designs them to be specific against a certain pathogen. You don't get cross-reactivity against typically other pathogens and very rarely you get cross-reactivity against um, uh, the host. You can select against it. And so by doing that, when you are giving an antibody against an exogenous target, a target that is present on a virus or another infectious agent, these antibodies have a predictable toxicity because they normally don't bind to anything else other than the target. Unlike vaccines, antibody can provide immediate protection and using several technologies, they can, this protection can last for an extended duration of time, usually far exceeding uh, one month. So with vaccines, you have to obviously give a dose of the vaccine, wait for the immune system to kick in, and eventually you get, you're gonna get um, uh, immunity, including antibodies, of course, that's gonna protect you for, uh, hopefully for the rest of your life, but antibodies can do that from the very, very beginning. And of course, vaccines don't work in, unfortunately, in all populations. So typically vaccines don't work very well in the elderly, and of course they don't work very well in immunocompromised patients. And unfortunately, especially for the case of COVID, these are the, um, the populations that are more susceptible okay, to COVID-19 disease. 
So again, we believe that the antibodies can provide uh, the necessary treatment for these populations that are not going to be um, uh, responsive to the vaccines. It's straightforward to identify multiple different antibodies that bind to different locations on um, uh, the pathogen. And by doing that, you can prevent mutational escape from the inhibition of the antibodies. We're going to show you data uh, to support that. And of course, using this technology that I described to you before, you can bypass all the traditional bot and you can rapidly make these um, uh, antibodies, rapidly put them in uh, tall cell lines and produce them in high amounts so that they can be ready uh, for, uh, uh, for clinical use. So let me take a step back and explain to you what we've been doing um, uh, with, uh, first of all, with the mouse, which is the workhorse for making all these antibodies. And here you can see in the red the sequence, uh, the, uh, uh, the Vs, the Ds, and the Js, the regions in the, uh, the mouse and uh, the, uh, the Vs and the Js in the kappa light chain here, okay? So you can see all these different regions, red corresponding to mouse and blue corresponding to human. And using this velocity gene technology, we basically swap uh, the variable regions of uh, the mouse with the variable regions of the human. So what you're getting when you're immunizing these mice, right in the mouse, you're getting a hybrid antibody where the variable, the business end of the molecule, are fully human sequences that have been in vivo selected um, against their, uh, their target, and um, of course, they've been negatively selected against all these other uh, mouse proteins, but you have the, the constant region of the antibody is mouse. So you're getting like basically a hybrid antibody. And the reason why we chose to have a hybrid molecule in the mouse was so that when this antibody is expressed on the surface of a B cell as a BCR, or when it signals through its, its um, FC region, you're getting proper interactions in the mouse and proper signaling in, um, in the mouse. And very easy, again, we are doing this robotically, you can basically PCR amplify all these antibodies that are coming out of the mouse and clone them robotically onto your favorite FC. So with one step process, you pretty much can get fully human antibodies um, out of these mice. And we've done, and uh, we've spent a lot of time characterizing these mice very carefully and from what we can tell, and at the bottom I have the, the references here, these mice are fully immunocompetent uh, they produce uh, every single immunological parameter that we've been able to evaluate. They appear as normal. Uh, they've been used for uh, hundreds of different, immuni different immunization projects, and they can produce um, antibodies that are, in many cases, indistinguishable from the antibodies that uh, we would normally make as, um, uh, as humans. So the antibody repertoire, the antibody properties of the antibodies you get out of the velocity mouse are pretty much the same as the antibodies you, get, you normally get from humans. And then what we do is uh, we are using uh, regular uh, B cell sorting technologies uh, to isolate the antigen positive uh, B cells from the splinocytes of these mice. <clears throat> and again, as I mentioned, we can automate in uh, using automation, we can convert these hybrid antibodies into fully human antibodies. So we get the antigen positive B cells, and uh, you know the robots do the cloning, and we are getting the fully human antibodies. And of course, we, uh, we can also do the same process out of convalescent humans. The difference here, of course, is that we don't need to do the swap because humans, of course, don't produce hybrid antibodies. They produce uh, antibodies from their native uh, uh, human FC. But using the same process, you can change the FC of the antibody to the FC um, uh, of choice. And when you have these antibodies, uh, we want to put it in a production cell line, okay? Uh, both to do the characterization of the antibodies but also to do the uh, scale up um, uh, later. And what we've done is we have identified a specific locus in the genome of the TSO cells, the producing cell line, that we know are expressing very high amounts of antibodies. And then we, uh, using the combination, we simply pop uh, into this locus, the heavy chain and the light chain of, um, uh, of the antibody. And then we, are, we can make an isogenic cell line. So um, a cell line where every single cell has the same genome, that's why they are isogenic in about two to three weeks after we have the DNA um, of um, uh, the antibody. Most companies, they require uh, nine months or more uh, to make uh, similar cell lines. And many companies go into uh, clinical development without having isogenic cell lines. But what that allows us is to do the initial characterization of the antibody and eventually production of the clinical material using the exact same cell line. So the same properties that you are screening for up front in your process, you are retaining all these, um, all these properties slowly as you are scaling up your antibodies, as you are characterizing them in vitro, in vivo, and eventually when you are testing them uh, uh, in humans. So again, we are trying to do this in a very uh, predictable fashion 
So it's the same material from the beginning to the end, and we are using the same technologies uh, for every single program. So as I've told you before, we are trying to basically put all these technologies together and, um, uh, and do the development of these antibodies um, as quickly as we can. And we can go from um, an outbreak or you know, initiation of um, a project, we can immunize our mice, we can start generating antibodies, um, uh, we can even create preclinical uh, uh, models to test these antibodies, which we've done, for example, in the case of MERS coronavirus. Uh, we can find the best antibodies out of the thousands of antibodies that uh, we start with. We can create uh, cell lines. So in about three to six months, depending on the project, okay, you can go from initiation of the project to having something, a cell line, uh, <clears throat> that is expressing an antibody that is well characterized, and you can put them in manufacturing, and eventually, after a few more months, we can, get it, we can have it ready for clinical development. We've done it um, at the bottom here. You can see uh, we've done it for Ebola. And again, I have the reference at the bottom that you can go and see uh, more details about this, uh, 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 these projects. For Ebola, we selected a cocktail of three antibodies that we call um, Regeneron EB3 uh, that was tested in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in a, a randomized clinical trial in collaboration with the NIH and the WHO. And um, we saw that we can dramatically um, uh, prevent mortality, Ebola-induced mortality, and uh, compared to the standard of care, which was another antibody cocktail actually in that trial called um, Zima. And actually, the Regeneron antibody was the reason why the clinical trial was halted, uh, because of the superiority um, um, during the trial. This antibody cocktail is currently under FDA review. It has received orphan drug designation as well as breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA. And we are expecting to, you know, hopefully get approval of these antibodies uh, sometime in the fall. I think that the due date for this uh, drug is uh, uh, October 25th. Uh, for MERS coronavirus, a coronavirus very similar to SARS coronavirus, um, we made an antibody cocktail consisting of two antibodies, and we have completed phase one clinical testing uh, in collaboration again with the NIH a few years ago. And now we are working hard, of course, to get antibodies, characterize these antibodies and put them in clinical development uh, for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, and that's the program I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. I think for this audience, I don't need to spend a lot of time giving um, uh, the background on um, uh, the virus. We all know that SARS-CoV-2 SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. It's an RNA virus that is the causative agent of the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. It's, of course, genetically similar to SARS, another bad uh, uh, coronavirus. And the important thing here is that it has a single glycoprotein on the surface called spike, and it's the interaction between spike and ACE2 that is required for, for <clears throat> attachment of the virus to the cell, fusion, and eventually entry of the virus into susceptible cells. Um, so what we've done, this is a very high-level overview of um, uh, the timeline, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Uh, back in um, uh, January, when we started getting all the reports about uh, uh, the virus, we started our discovery program. Um, and this is when we started uh, cloning uh, the spike in different constructs and making assays and things like that. Um, late in January, we expanded our collaboration with um, uh, Human Health Services, um, uh, BARDA, one of the departments in um, HHS, that has been uh, working with us over the past um, four years or so with, in, on a, a lot of these programs. So we expanded our collaboration, and sometime in February, we started screening for these antibodies. Uh, by April, we were ready with characterized antibodies. We started the manufacturing. And then June 11th, um, we initiated clinical trials. So we had the uh, initial uh, material that came out of uh, our manufacturing facility um, that is in Rensselaer, New York. Um, and we announced the initiation of the clinical trials. I'm going to tell you a few more things about how we are um, uh, performing these trials. And the same uh, day, we announced that uh, all the, the publication of all the preclinical data uh, that I'm going to go through on, you know, in, during the next few slides. And our goal here is to test these antibodies in the clinic um, over the next few months. We already have uh, hundreds of patients in the role um, in these uh, studies, but we are also continuing manufacturing these antibodies. So hopefully, uh, if we show efficacy in the clinic, then we're going to have hundreds of thousands of doses uh, of these antibodies that can be available for both prophylaxis and treatment <clears throat> beginning um, late in the summer, so uh, which is actually uh, quickly coming up. 
So um, this is a slightly more detailed uh, version of the, uh, of the timeline. As I told you before, we started, we initiated this program in uh, uh, January, and that's when we started making the reagents for this program. We immunized our mice at the beginning of February. <clears throat> we, um, and the mice were, of course, uh, making these antibodies during the month of February, and we started isolating antibodies at the beginning of March. Um, about a week later, we also got um, uh, some samples from uh, convalescent humans, uh, people that were infected with SARS-CoV-2 and recovered from COVID-19 disease. And we started also isolating antibodies uh, from these um, uh, human survivors. So over the last uh, month or so for this program, what we've been able to do is to get a, a very large panel of antibodies that are coming um, from both uh, mice and humans fully human antibodies out of, of, uh, of the genetically um, uh, engineered velocity mouse and fully human antibodies coming from convalescent humans and compare them side by side so we can choose the best antibodies that would eventually go into clinical development. So <clears throat> the goal of this program was to get two very po as potent as possible uh, SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies that are also neutralizing um, uh, as many as possible known variants of the receptor binding domain um, of um, uh, the spike coronavirus. And we wanted to get a cocktail of two non competing antibodies, two antibodies that can bind to these different epitopes on the surface of uh, the spike protein to allow for both high neutralization potency, but also protection against the um, uh, escape. And eventually we wanted to use this combination of antibodies for both prophylaxis and treatment. And just to give you an idea of the numbers, we isolated and screened about uh, 3,300 antibody, uh, antibodies. And all these antibodies were screened uh, through multiple different assays that include uh, neutralization, initially with pseudoviruses and eventually with um, uh, uh, real replicating uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, different binding assays uh, to pseudoviruses, soluble protein, uh, trimer, uh, Bicor assays to measure the affinity of these antibodies to their um, uh, targets, uh, different Luminex assays, <clears throat> so we can beam these antibodies into different classes, blocking analyzers and things like that. And we ended up having uh, nine antibodies that are very broad and potent, and that you can mix and, mix and match them together in 17 different combinations. And this is what we evaluated in, uh, in our different assays. So here you can see um, uh, some representative data of uh, some of these antibodies that you can see here uh, with uh, you know, their, their, their code names. And you can see that uh, these are very potent neutralizing antibodies with FICOMOLA and IC50s uh, on both SARS-CoV-2, a VSV pseudotype with SARS-CoV-2 spike, as well as replicating uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, uh, virus. So all of these antibodies, so very potent neutralization at very low concentrations of, um, uh, of these molecules. As I told you before, we also wanted to make sure these antibodies are binding to as many uh, variants of the virus as possible. As the virus spreads around uh, the world now, it's uh, slowly accumulating um, uh, mutations in multiple different sites, including in the receptor binding domain where our antibodies are, uh, we know are binding to. So what we ended up doing is we downloaded about uh, 22,000 sequences. This is the number of sequences that were available back in April uh, when we went through this exercise. And um, we found all the different variants within the receptor binding domain that you can see here on the left of the table. And we made BSV pseudotypes with every single one of them. And then we took our antibodies and we did neutralization assays on all of these different variants. And at the top here, um, <clears throat> you can see the, uh, the antibodies that are broad and they are binding with these uh, nanomolar IC50s and they are neutralizing, I'm sorry, uh, with nanomolar IC50s um, <clears throat> all these different uh, variants, because we wanted to make sure that our antibodies are binding to sites that the virus cannot easily um, uh, change as it's spreading um, uh, around the world. Of course, this is an exercise that we are continuously doing. Uh, there are, um, every day, there are new sequences of SARS-CoV-2 that are being published and deposited online. Uh, so every uh, few days, we are doing a download of these sequences, and if any new variants are being identified, we are uh, always making these um, uh, spike variants in the lab and we are testing all of our antibodies uh, for um, neutralization. And then we wanted to spend some time to try to understand where these antibodies are actually um, uh, binding to. So the first technique that we use is something called uh, hydrogen deuterium exchange. 
Um, so basically, you're binding your antibody to your uh, target, which in this case is a separate binding domain um, uh, of spike. Um, and then you are monitoring <coughs> using mass spec uh, the exchange of uh, hydrogen with um, uh, deuterium. So all these sites that are protected, uh, you cannot detect any exchange. Uh, and the sites that are not protected by your antibody, this is where you see the uh, exchange between uh, uh, the, the two different molecules. So, and as you can see here, we were able to identify with our uh, lead antibodies. I'm showing um, some representative data here. Uh, so I, I, I hope you can see with white here uh, is the receptor binding domain in three different views from the front, the back, and from the top. Uh, and you can see pretty much where these antibodies uh, are binding to. So you can see this uh, at cluster one, these antibodies that are binding at the top, cluster two that is binding on the side, um, and a little bit at the bottom. Uh, cluster three that is mostly on the side and the top, um, and cluster four that is the other side of, um, uh, the, of um, the molecule. And using this assay, this very crude way of getting the evidence of these antibodies, we started imagining pairs of antibodies that are binding to distinct sites on, uh, um, uh, on the surface of um, uh, the glycoprotein. The second assay we used uh, to properly identify uh, uh, pairs of these antibodies was something that we call that is a, a more traditional cross competition assay, uh, where you are binding your antibody to your target, and then you are trying to detect binding of your second antibody. And the numbers that you can see here in the table uh, is the ability of the second antibody uh, to bind to the complex of the first antibody with your spike. So when the number is very low, it means that your your second antibody is not binding. When the number is very high, uh, you can detect binding of your second antibody. And what you can see here is you can detect um, a pair of antibodies, 33 and 87. So you can see here uh, that you can detect binding of your second antibody in the presence of the first one. Uh, but you can also see pairs where the first antibody is completely blocking um, uh, the second antibody, like 34 for 89, which presumably means that these antibodies are sterically blocking each other. And you can see uh, some pairs like 87 and 89 where you see some partial competition. So sometimes from one side you can see binding, but from the other side um, uh, you don't, which means that uh, probably these um, epitopes are partially overlapping, but are not exactly um, uh, the same. And again, by doing that, we can detect antibodies that can simultaneously bind on the surface of spike, and presumably these, the two epitopes of these antibodies are um, uh, separate. So using the combination of all the data, the neutralization, threat and the binding properties of these antibodies, we end up selecting um, a, a, a cocktail of two very potent neutralizers, 33 and 87, uh, that, can block that can neutralize all known variants of the virus, but can also bind um, independently. And then we did some CRAL-EM studies uh, to basically confirm that the epitope of these antibodies are uh, distinct. Okay, And you can see here in the blue, is the receptor binding domain of, um, uh, of spike, okay? And you can see here uh, one antibody that is binding on one side and the other antibody that is binding um, on, uh, uh, on the other side. Both antibodies are actually decorating the ACE2 binding region. And that's exactly why both of these antibodies are blockers and are uh, inhibiting the interaction between the receptor binding domain and the ACE2 receptors, okay? So the structure also gives you insight, of course, on how these antibodies um, are uh, uh, functioning. And we are now working with um, uh, Larry Sapiro and David Ho from Columbia to get um, uh, structures for all of our large collection of um, antibodies so we can get more information about the structure functional relationship for all of these antibodies. The more information, the widest uh, pool of antibodies we can use for all these assays, the more we learn about uh, how these antibodies uh, block the virus. And the final functional assay we use to characterize this antibody is this, what we call this escape assay. So what we're doing here is we have, again, our replicating now VSV pseudotypes. And after several passages in the presence of these antibodies, we are looking for the ability of these viruses to grow in higher and higher concentrations of these antibodies. So you're basically looking with uh, red here, you can see the wells here, you can see virus, and you're slowly waiting for this red to go to the left. Uh, as you're increasing your antibody concentration. And very interestingly, what you see is with the single antibodies, you immediately get escape, okay? And you can see this uh, uh, shift to the left. With the antibody that using this, uh, the antibody uh, pair, that by cross-competition assays, we detected that they are binding on the same epitope, 
you can see that pretty much they behave like a single antibody and they move all the way to the left. But again, when you have these combinations of non-combining antibodies, you do not easily get escape. You do not get escape against those. And again, showing that this uh, proper selection of antibodies that are binding to distinct sites can safeguard um, against escape. And finally, I want to share with you some data that we deposited to BioArchive um, a few days ago that shows the in vivo efficacy of these um, uh, antibodies now. And we tested them in both um, uh, non-human primates and hamsters. Um, and um, so you're aware that non-human primates have a fairly mild disease, hamsters have a very severe disease. What I'm going to show you is uh, the risk of data very quickly. Uh, we tested these antibodies for both prophylaxis, what you can see in this slide, so giving these antibodies three days uh, prior to challenge with the virus. And then we measured these um, initial pharyngeal swabs, as well as BAL to get titers from uh, lowering the line. And you can see that in both cases, uh, we can pretty much completely block the uh, replication of the virus uh, when, we, when you are treating, pre-treating with these antibodies. Uh, the red here is the placebo uh, median, okay, what you see in the placebo animals, and the, uh, and the black is uh, the viral load that you are getting in um, uh, the treated animals. And when you're doing a similar experiment, uh, but you're giving your antibodies uh, after these animals are, um, uh, are infected, uh, you can see, you can again uh, detect um, that the viral load uh, the, or the decline of the viral load is accelerated, meaning showing that uh, these antibodies uh, can stop the replication of the virus in the lungs um, and can uh, slowly um, uh, start clearing the virus. And again, as you can see here in the oral source, for example, uh, where in all the animals that were treated with these antibodies, the clearance of the virus is several days faster than what you see in the placebo animals, which makes us fairly, um, uh, which is, gives us hope that these antibodies can work uh, in um, uh, humans, hopefully both uh, prophylactically and um, uh, therapeutically. And that's exactly what we are doing now. We are testing, as I told you, June 11th, we started recruiting for all these clinical trials, and we are testing this combination of antibodies we call Regeneron COP2, uh, for in both prophylaxis going all the way to treatment. This slide shows you the different stages of COVID-19 uh, 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 disease. And with different boxes, you can see the different um, uh, stages that we are uh, picking our patients to test these antibodies from true prophylaxis, uh, where we're giving these um, antibodies to people that are at high risk uh, for, for uh, uh, contact, uh, contacting the virus, but have not been infected yet. Uh, we are giving them the antibodies and we are monitoring for several weeks and months and we look for prevention of infection. We have an, a, 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 the ambulatory setting where people were just diagnosed, they had just been infected with the virus, and we are looking to prevent hospitalization of this population and hopefully faster clearance of the virus. And then we have two different settings in um, uh, the hospital uh, where we have people that are either early or late in the hospital. And again, we are, see, we are trying to see any signals uh, we can decrease the hospitalization time um, uh, for these patients. And with that, I would like to thank, you know, the many, 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 many people that uh, participate in this uh, project. It truly takes a village um, to, of course, you know, um, uh, select for these antibodies, produce them, and now uh, testing them in the clinic. And of course, uh, you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Christos, thanks very much for that lovely talk. So I presume that everyone is thinking that the story with antibodies will be the sooner the better in terms of use? Yes, that's the dogma. I mean, that's actually what we saw with Ebola as well. So we had some clinical data uh, that uh, when people presented at the hospital with, uh, with lower viral load uh, of the Ebola, the, um, the mortality rate uh, when they were treated with these antibodies was significantly lower than the people that were presenting, presenting at the hospital later. Uh, so that's why we divided you know, the, this like, um, a continuum of the patients in multiple different groups. And we are testing all these different groups, prophylaxis, ambulatory, and even different stages in the hospital. And we are trying to monitor, it, to monitor uh, the, um, you know, how late in the hospitalized setting uh, these antibodies can work. We'll find out. We have to wait for the clinical data. Right. Presumably very late will be too late in the sense exactly. that the virus is already cleared. And, exactly. And, and then you have to deal with the inflammation probably and all the sequel of the infection and not with the virus. So at some point, the virus has done its damage and, you know, the body is dealing with uh, the aftermath of the infection. So we have a question from your friend Saul who asks, what about any differences there might be between 
the antibodies working on pseudotypes versus the real virus. Yeah, we actually see very, very similar neutralization uh, between the pseudotypes and the real virus. So the VSV pseudotype um, uh, uh, actually can predict neutralization of the real virus uh, fairly, um, uh, fairly well. And that's something that uh, many other people um, uh, have seen as well. There are actually some reports that have been published comparing different pseudotype systems with the real virus, and the VSV is one of the most predictive systems. I think, yeah, David Ho's people see that also, that they tend to track quite well. Exactly, yeah. Um, Darcy Kelly asks how these antibodies will be administered, and I assume it's just IV and... and you know. Well, for the prophylaxis setting, we are trying to have sub Q administrations because it's easier. Uh, so for prophylaxis, what we see in animal settings, and again, what we've seen in uh, other clinical trials, is that the earlier, you also need less antibody. So presumably, you can give that antibody a uh, sub Q. In the hospitalized setting, presumably, you're going to need higher amounts of these antibodies, so you have to give them um, IV. 